In this video, I'm going to introduce the root locus plot, which is a fundamental tool of classical feedback control design. I'm going to start with my standard feedback configuration, where I have a reference input R of t, a measured output Y of t, a linear system, which is typically a physical plant governed by a linear constant coefficient ordinary differential equation, which we can Laplace transform and write in transfer function form, which we denote with the symbol G of s, and a controller, which is typically a linear circuit, which can be constructed with a handful of resistors, capacitors, and operational amplifiers, which is also governed by a linear constant coefficient ordinary differential equation, which we can Laplace transform and write in transfer function form uh, and denote with the symbol D of S. Our input-output relationship from R of S to Y of S, which we typically denote T of S, um, is, as derived in a previous discussion, G of S times D of S over 1 plus G of S times D of S. Denoting G of S times D of S as L of S, we can then simply write that as L of S over 1 plus L of S. And then writing L of S as a rational function of S, so K times a monic polynomial of order M, denoted B of S in the numerator, divided by a monic polynomial of order n, denoted a of s in the denominator. And we're, we're going to assume that n is greater than or equal to m, so that this rational function is um, proper. In the case that n is greater than m, we refer to it um, as strictly proper. In the case that n is equal to m, we refer to it as semi-proper. And we're going to note, denote n minus m um, as the relative degree uh, of this rational function. Um, and so it's going to be greater than or equal to 0. Again, equal to 0 if it's semi-proper and greater than to 0 um, if it's strictly proper. So what we do with a root locus plot is we try to understand how the closed loop poles move as we vary a parameter in the system. And typically, but not always, but typically we're going to take a look at the variation with respect to the overall gain on our, uh, our expression for L of s. Um, and uh, remember that we have dynamics in both G of s and D of s. So some of the poles and zeros of, these, uh, of this transfer function L of s are related to the poles and zeros of G of s, and some are related to D of s. But the overall gain is something that we could certainly adjust in D of S. Um, and so that appears explicitly in this expression uh, right here and right here. And so if we consider the case with small values of K, so if K is very, very small, the denominator here um, is dominated by the term A of S. And so if we're looking for the poles of T of S, namely the values of S that make the denominator go to zero, um, when K is small, and then this term is essentially negligible. And the poles of T of S in this limit for small k are very near the values of S that make A of S go to zero, namely the open loop poles. On the other hand, if k is large, then taking a look at this expression, this term becomes negligible compared to B of S. So in the limit that k becomes large, the values of S that make the denominator of T of S go to zero are uh, approaching the values of S that make B of S go to zero. In other words, the poles of the closed loop transfer function are approaching the zeros of the open loop transfer function in the limit that k is made large. And so the root locus plot simply tracks that movement for whatever um, system you have, for whatever A of S and B of S you have, um, as you change a parameter. So let's consider a few examples, and you'll quickly get the hang of it. So the first example we'll take is L1 of S is equal to K times S plus C over CS. Okay, so in this case, our B of S is S plus C, our A of S is C times S, and what we're interested in is the values of S that make the denominator go to zero. Again, the poles of the closed loop transfer function. So let's just set the denominator equal to zero. And so A of S is C times S um, plus K times B of S is S plus C. Okay, we arrange the terms. So we have C plus K times S plus um, K times C. And then solve for S. So this implies that um, S is equal to minus KC over C plus K. And uh, it's useful, I think, to divide both sides of this by C. So we can actually think of S over C as uh, minus k tilde, or sorry, minus k over c plus k, and further we can define a k tilde as being just k over c, 
and that's useful right here. So let's go ahead and plug that in. So dividing the top and the bottom by C, we have minus K tilde over 1 plus K tilde. So we see that the shape of this locus doesn't actually depend upon C. K tilde just goes from small to large, just like K does. And so if we want to uh, take a look at where the closed loop poles move as a function of K, we just need to plot this. So let's go ahead and plot a root locus plot. And we're going to have, uh, in this case, we had a uh, pole at the origin and a zero at S is equal to minus C. A so pole at the origin and a zero at s is equal to minus c, or s over c is equal to minus 1, if you like. Um, and then we're just going to consider what happens um, to this um, uh, closed loop pole location as k is made from small to large. So for small k, this is very near, well, 0, obviously. It's about uh, minus some very small number uh, over c, which is constant. Uh, and so let's consider first the case with k positive. And so if k is small and positive, then we have some negative number. So minus epsilon over c plus epsilon is very near to minus epsilon over c. So we have some small number um, over here. And as k is positive and made larger, then we have minus k over, well, in the limit that k is made really, really large, c is negligible. So we have about minus k over k, which is about minus 1. So s over c is like minus 1, or s is equal to about minus c. So for large k, it goes all the way over here. So for various different values of k, it's going over. And if we plot those dots close together, we get what is commonly called a branch of the root locus that goes from the x to the o. So the closed loop pole moves from the open loop pole to the open loop zero. And in this case, we have one of each. So now let's consider the case when k is negative. So um, if k is negative, we can go ahead and plot that case. And so we have uh, open loop pole at the origin, and open loop zero at s is equal to minus c. And again, we have our closed form expression here. We're going to consider the case with k less than or equal to 0. Um, and so for k small and negative, so let's say k is equal to minus epsilon, we have minus and minus is a plus. So we have plus epsilon over c minus epsilon. So plus epsilon over c. So we have a positive number, which is small. So it's going off this way. And as that number epsilon is made larger, um, or in other words, k is made larger in magnitude, uh, but further negative, so further into left half plane on the negative real axis. <clears throat> so uh, then we see that um, if uh, k is made larger and negative, then this is becoming a larger positive number, and the denominator is becoming a smaller positive number. And so this starts shooting off to the, uh, to the right in a hurry. And um, as k approaches, it's negative, as k approaches minus c, the denominator goes to 0. So this goes all the way out to infinity. And then as k moves beyond that, and so it's minus c plus epsilon, then the sign of the denominator flips, and so it starts coming in from the other side. And so we come in that way. And then in the limit of large in magnitude, but negative k, um, so we have a negative number here. So negative negative is a positive. Um, as, uh, um, as k um, goes larger in magnitude, we have um, positive L um, over C plus L on the limit that L is, uh, or sorry, C minus L on the limit that L is made big, that's approaching minus 1. So in other words, S over C as K is equal to minus L as L is made big, this approaches plus L over minus L. In other words, it approaches minus 1. So S over C is minus 1, so S is equal to minus C. <coughs> so it comes in there. So we have that analytically here. So let's consider a little um, larger case. So let's take um, L2 of s is equal to k times s plus c squared over cs squared. And so again, we're just going to uh, look for the values of s that make the denominator here go to 0. So 0 is equal to a of s, which is c times s squared, plus k times b of s, which is s plus c squared. So multiply that out. We have c squared plus k 
okay um, times s squared. And uh, then we have plus 2cks plus kc squared. Okay, and so now we're going to apply the quadratic formula. So we have a quadratic equals zero. So we're going to look for the values of s that make this go to zero. So let's write the quadratic formula. Um, s is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 a c all over 2a. Okay, and again, uh, I'd like to uh, have an idea of the, uh, the picture of s over c. So let me divide this by c. So I'll knock out that c and knock out a c squared inside the square root. So I'll just knock out that one and that one. And so again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a modified outside constant. So let me divide my k by c squared. So in this case, I'm going to define my k tilde as k over c squared. So let me rewrite this. Um, for that value of k tilde. So let's divide the numerator and the denominator by c squared. So we have minus 2 k tilde plus minus the square root of. Dividing the numerator by c squared means dividing the inside the square root by c to the fourth. So k squared over c to the fourth is k tilde squared. Minus four, um, so we're going to divide inside the square root by c to the uh, c to the fourth. So let's divide inside the parentheses by c squared and outside the parentheses by c squared. So we have one plus k tilde times k tilde divided by dividing the denominator by c squared is obviously two one plus k tilde. So that's s over c. So again, as in the previous case that we had over here, the pattern in the space of s is independent of what c is. c just scales the space of s, uh, but the pattern is that given by, uh, by this expression here. And so if we plot this in the, um, the space of s, as we did up here. So now we have um, two open loop poles at the origin and two open loop zeros at s is equal to minus c. And so if we uh, take a look at this expression and insert a k tilde as k tilde goes um, from small to large, um, we see that the connection um, is simply shape of a circle coming over there, and the other branch of it comes over there. So we have an analytic expression for that, so you can stick in any value um, of k up here or k tilde down there that you like, uh, and just put dots and then connect the dots, and you'll see you get these two branches of the locus. So this is the case for k greater than or equal to zero, and in the case for k less than or equal to zero, So again, we have two poles at the origin, two zeros at s is equal to minus c. And so now we're going to take the case with um, k less than or equal to zero. And we see in this case, so we're going to um, plug in negative k, or alternatively negative k tilde um, in here. So we have 4 k tilde squared minus 4 uh, k tilde. Uh, times that for k tilde squared. So what we're left with is minus 4 times k tilde. k tilde is negative, and so inside the square root we're going to have a positive number. So we're going to have um, minus uh, 2k tilde 
plus a positive number over, uh, over this expression, and minus 2k tilde minus a positive number uh, over that expression. So you plot those two branches, and uh, that's easily done. Um, and what you get are a bunch of values that uh, shoot off this way for one branch, and a bunch of values that shoot off this way for the other branch. <coughs> As k um, approaches um, minus c squared, k is negative, remember, as k is approaching minus c squared, or in other words, as k tilde is approaching minus 1, um, this shoots off all the way to infinity um, and comes in the other side, whereas due to a cancellation, the other branch just continues moving along. Um, and as um, k approaches infinity, uh, then you can take a look at the terms dominating in here, um, and you can see that um, you come all the way in to um, s is equal to minus c from that direction, and that branch comes in from that direction. Okay, so uh, we can continue this trend, um, and so let's just do uh, one more. These first two cases are easy. This one was a linear, that one was a quadratic. We can do by that, those by hand. We can consider for more. So for instance, L3 of S um, is equal to K S plus C cubed over CS cubed, um, or you could even consider the case um, L4 um, is equal to K S plus C to the fourth over CS to the fourth. And the trends are similar. Um, as we go higher order, of course, doing it um, by hand no longer becomes tractable. Well, I suppose you could do the, uh, the third order case. But we can easily use a computer, right? So we can plug in A of S, plug in B of S into the denominator, set it equal to zero, solve for the roots of S. And what we get um, in the uh, third order case here um, is, so now we have three poles at the origin and three zeros at s is equal to minus c. And so what we get, um, if we go ahead and plot the branches of the locus, um, is simply a branch that goes from the, uh, from the origin to the, the zeros, um, and two more branches, one that comes up here, and one that comes around here. So that's the case with k positive, and the case with k negative So again, we have three poles at the origin, three zeros at s is equal to minus c. And the case with k0, which again you can get simply by plotting, trying several values of k, again we're going to take um, k has been k has been uh, negative in this case, and so in this case, um, instead of going off to the left, it's seen when you go ahead and solve for the roots, it goes off to the right for a critical value of k. Um, it goes all the way off to infinity. Beyond that, um, it comes in and goes there, and there are two additional branches: one which comes up, and one which comes down. And if we were also to do this for the L4 case, uh, just to take one more step of this, um, we're going to have four poles at the origin, four zeros at s is equal to minus c. And in this case, um, we have Turns out to be two big circles. Uh, it comes through here at about a 45 degree angle, well, exactly a 45 degree angle. One of them comes around there, closes around like that. The other one comes around there, closes around like that. And so it goes from the X to the O, from the X to the O, from the X 
JDL. Okay, so that's the, uh, the, the case where you have um, K positive and the case with K negative is similar. So we have, again, four K, four poles at the origin, four zeros, at s is equal to minus c. Let me draw this out a little farther. And in this case, we have um, one branch of the locus going off to the right, and then coming in here. It goes to infinity for a particular value of k, and then continues on the left side and comes in there. Um, and one branch goes off to the left, and comes in there and one branch that goes up straight up and circles around there, and one branch that goes straight down, and one branch that circles around there. So this is the case with um, K negative. And you could do higher order cases if you want, but this is plenty to see the trend. Okay, so now we need to think about what happens in the limit that C gets big. So as I've argued in the, uh, the case of L1 and L2, the picture remains the same. It's only where, uh, how we scale it, where negative c is that changes. And so as negative c increases from negative 1 to negative 10 to negative 100 to negative 1,000, it's as if that point's um, shooting way far off there. And so if we want to look in the vicinity of the origin, so say order one values of s near the origin, it's as if our picture is zooming in for each increase of c on ever smaller boxes in the vicinity of the origin. So in this case, it's scooting to the left of that window. In this case, um, it's scooting to the right out that window. Um, in this case, it's going up and down out that window. In this case, it's going to the left and the right out that window. Let's just keep going. In this case, Um, it's one is going off to the left in that window and the other two are shooting in fact at 120 degrees apart. And as we bring this window in closer and closer, this is effectively just a straight line. So it's one to the left, one up and to the right, and one down and to the right. And if you measure it, it's 120 degrees apart. And as we zoom in here, it's a similar picture, um, but it's flipped. So we have one going off to the right, one going 120 degrees over up and to the left, and one going down and to the left. Um, and as we zoom in here, we've got four branches going off, and as the box gets smaller and smaller and smaller, they're just going off in the middle of each quadrant. One, two, three, four, four branches going off. Um, and if we zoom in here, As the box is made smaller and smaller, you see we're just going off on the negative real axis, the positive real axis, um, the positive imaginary axis, and the negative imaginary axis, and it goes around. All right, so that's one argument about what this looks like um, in uh, the limit of large C. Um, it's just like in, if you're looking in the vicinity of, uh, of say, order one values of, of S, as C is made large, it's just like you're zooming in on any one of, of these several pictures. And so you get an idea of what these asymptotes that shoot out to infinity, um, how they will be arranged in these several cases. Another way we can take a look at this, uh, obviously, is we can um, take our expression for, uh, say, L1 of S to begin with. So L1 of S uh, approaches as C approaches infinity, well, as L1 of S uh, as C gets large, this approach is just, um, well, S becomes negligible compared to C for order one values of S. So this just becomes like K times C over CS, cancel the Cs. This just becomes like K over S. And uh, L2 um, just becomes like, as C goes to infinity, uh, just grows like um, k s plus c squared over um, c squared s squared. Um, as c is made large, the order one values of s are negligible compared to the c. Um, and so in the limit that s goes to infinity, this is just like k c squared over c squared s squared. 
cancel the C squareds. It's just like Kevra squared. And similarly um, for L3, um, and the limit that C goes to infinity, um, we have uh, similar arguments, K over S cubed. Okay, so in those limits, then we can um, plot our, uh, our root locus plot. Uh, and again, it's just the picture that we have here. So K over S looks like, um, for K positive, looks like what's in the box there shooting off to the left. Um, for K negative, shooting off to the right there. And um, we can keep going. Uh, let's do L2 and L3. So we have two X's here, uh, two closed loop poles, sorry, two open loop poles. And the open loop zeros have scooted off to infinity in this limit. Um, and so the um, in the, for the k-positive case, for the k-positive case, this goes straight up. So as c goes off to minus infinity, the curvature of this thing approaches infinity, and so this is going just straight up and straight down. In this case, it's going straight to the right and straight to the left. Let's do one more case, because we have room. So here we have three x's. And our O's are uh, moving off to infinity. Um, and so um, in the case with K positive, um, we have this picture, shoots off this way. And uh, sorry, K positive. K positive, it shoots off this way. And this way this way. And as you zoom in and zoom in, you'll see that uh, these um, different branches are 120 degrees apart. Um, and for K negative, um, we have three X's here. Um, and the O's have scooted off to infinity, and it's the same picture but reversed. So this goes off to infinity that way, and these are 120 degrees apart. Similarly for the uh, for the higher order cases, so that's one argument for how we get from the semi-proper case to the strictly proper case with relative degree one for the k positive and k negative case, relative degree two for the k positive and the k negative case, and relative degree three for the k positive and k negative case, and you can extend that har argument uh, to uh, higher orders um, if you like, and so. That gives a picture of what to expect. In the next video, what we're going to do is we're going to discuss this in terms of the Riemann sphere.